It's, it's Shima first, huh? Yes. Well, it's, so it's not your, your no, no, no. Uh, let me. You have, you have to, to close it, and it's on the on board. So please, you, can you sit and then we continue the Congress? So I'm, I'm really honored to chair this session and I will first present uh, Shima Kirtalic, who uh, is a doctorate researcher about uh, um, early modern maps and will um, and here uh, it's part of the media card project here and I would like to present uh, her she will speak about how to make a hundred atlases insights into the production methods of Batista Agnese and please go on Can everybody hear me? Yes? Okay. I'll try. <laughs> All right. Uh, welcome to another session, everyone. I'm very pleased to be in this session with Chet. We're both speaking about Agnese today, but I think uh, what I expect is we will complement each other well. I will handle the artisanal aspects and Chet will deal with some erudite matters. So uh, the topic of uh, my presentation will be mostly about the kind of granular hands-on aspects of Batista Agnese's atlas production. And the starting point with Agnese is always a lamentation, which is that we have about 100 atlases and several charts, and we know almost nothing about the guy. And I will break the bad news right now. We're not going to learn much more about his bio from me either. But I hope we'll learn some other things. Um, and the starting point uh, here is uh, with this atlas, the first Agnese atlas that I examined personally, which is kept in the Geographical Society of Lisbon. This atlas was uh, attributed to Agnese around the turn of the 20th century. And when Ernesto de Vasconcelos looked at it, he noticed that this very basic atlas without any miniatures, it didn't have a rich ornament, but the, the drawing was most perfect. And so my challenge today will be to show you some of the hidden labor that is behind that apparent perfection. So <clears throat> the plan of the talk today will first be starting as well before any ink hits the parchment, looking at uh, how the page was planned, the preparation for the drawing, looking briefly, because it's very boring, at the sequence of execution, and then a few words on the illuminating. I'll then make just a couple of remarks, because I've talked about this before, on some of Agnese's frequent collaborators, trying to link it to the workflow and the organization of his workshop or atelier. Then I'll discuss how Agnese recycled, reused, and adapted geographical information. Uh, and finally, I will make a little note of an attribution that I, I hope uh, you guys will also accept. So, when we talk about the planning of the, of the charts or of the non-geographical content in an atlas, we're referring mostly to four kinds of marks. 
And because of the first two, I can't really refer to mediums because the first two don't deposit any material. Uh, these are dry point, prick marks, metal point, and carbon transfer. So I'm going to just move us through these different methods of making marks um, <coughs> and show you some examples. So the first uh, mark making method, uh, it's well suited for parchment because it's quite durable. And this is uh, basically used almost universally in nautical charts to draw the hidden circle. Yeah, exactly. And here you can see the kind of instrument that would have been used. Now with Agnese, he wasn't particularly heavy handed in making these marks. With some chart makers, they properly rip up the parchment, uh, but nonetheless, if you look well at the digital reproductions, you can often spot it, and in person, it's generally quite easy. And this is more or less um, the only real application of dry point that I've observed uh, Agnese using regularly is for the hidden circle. The next sort of mark uh, are prick marks, and it doesn't, uh, this doesn't mean that the surface is perforated, but it's just to make an indentation with a compass, with a needle, whatever. Uh, so here, you can't see it very well, but uh, at these darker points where the ink is behaving a bit funny, this is one of the signs that you probably have a prick mark there. But I'll show you now a photo that I took where it's rather more visible. This is a kind of curious one because, as you can see, the logical place to put these prick marks would have been at the edge of the declination table. But it seems that there was a change of mind about where things would be positioned. And uh, he's, he's not an idiot, so he was able to use those lines and a straight edge um, to uh, create the table with the wrongly placed prick marks. And then finally, these prick marks are seen any place that the cartographer needed to divide a circle. And this is abundantly common. This is almost universal in nautical charts that they're placed at the rum nodes uh, and also on the calendar. This wasn't only used by cartographers. Here, for example, we have astronomical tables of the 15th century, and you see the same strategy. It seems to have been pretty universal uh, scribal practice when you have to divide a circle to mark the intervals with prick marks because they're quite unobtrusive. <coughs> the next kind of material, now we can properly speak of materials, is uh, either metal point or possibly in some cases graphite pencil. And Yeze's career overlapped with the dissemination of that uh, writing uh, material. And this is used primarily to rule lettering, as you can see. Also on the calendar wheel it was used. But also on several atlases it was used to sketch in these zodiac signs, which is a curious thing. Uh, you don't see this kind of underdrawing on the numbers in the tables. It's really just for these odd symbols. And in these two cases, probably in rather early atlases, so it may be that he wanted to be sure of what he was writing beforehand, or he didn't want to have to rely on a model. I'm not quite certain. The tricky thing with seeing this kind of mark is you really do need very high resolution scans to be able to see it. So it's hard to build a chronology, but it is a kind of peculiarity of uh, Agnese's use of metal point. And the final kind of mark is that which is left by the carbon transfer technique, which Agnese only used for coastlines and geographical information. You don't see it for ruling. You don't see it for really anything else on the charts. Uh, this kind of mark has a quite characteristic appearance. I'm not going to describe how this technique functioned. If you don't know, but you would like to, in the exhibition, it's explained with pictures. The key thing for us to bear in mind is only that this copying method, where you take geographical information from a model and transfer it onto a new sheet, 
operates at a one-to-one -one scale. So you're not, you're not going to be able to switch the size of your chart if you're transferring from the model with this method. And here are a couple of examples of what this looks like on the charts. Uh, Agnese was actually able to capture a relatively good variety of um, signs on his charts using this. For example, the crosses, you can see they're traced in as a cross. When there's just stippling running along the coastline, you can see little dotted lines. But when we have these kind of shoals, usually they're just blocked in. And the, the tricky thing about that is once you finish the transfer drawing, you have the edges of shoals rendered as the same coherent line as the coastlines. And if you were negligent, if you were not knowledgeable about your geographical design, you could very well just trace that over in ink, which I've never seen Agnese do. So kudos to him. However, uh, mistakes did happen. <laughs> And I'd like to show you a kind of funny one that I saw in two Alice's in the UK this year. So here we have uh, the atlas kept at the Bodleian. I've been told it's pronounced that way. Uh, and you can observe that near, but not really, really near, the coastlines are what appear to be dry point marks with the exact same sort of geographical information as the coasts. Curious. And here at the British Library Codex, you see the same thing. Now, the most reasonable hypothesis for what caused these marks is that the page slipped while Agnese was executing a transfer drawing. And for a change, because I showed you pictures where you can see the drawing quite clearly, for a change when the drawing, the error was really displaced and conspicuous, he actually made the effort to erase it so it was possible for him to erase these carbon transfer marks, it seems. He just didn't really care to when it wasn't going to be quite noticeable sitting right near the, near the coast. So these are the main kinds of marks that Agnese was using to prepare the drawing. So before even he set about doing any sort of work, uh, a lot of preparation had been executed. And although copying the coastlines was a relatively mechanical task, a lot of these activities required measuring, required using straight edge. There was an element of constructing anew to make every atlas. So it wasn't uh, completely like idiot work. Now, a blessing for us, uh, if we want to understand the sequence in which Agnese executed the coloring, once this was all planned, is that he tended to use rather heavy bodied paints. And this means that the stratigraphy of the paints is pretty evident under even low magnification microscopy. And yeah, I just took these two more or less random images because uh, although it doesn't show it as well on that screen, it, it shows a bit uh, how it can be quite obvious. So this flow chart here. It's based on the Lisbon Atlas, and it shows the pattern that I've observed in several Agnese atlases of um, the order in which he completed this work. Of course, I don't, I don't talk about all of the steps. I just talk about the ones that can be identified in their order. So uh, he started with the border, then the hidden circle, and seemingly the north-south lines tangent to that circle, black rum lines, green rum lines, red rum lines, transfer drawing, inking, tinting the coasts blue, and then finally <laughs> adding any gilding if it's uh, present. And there's a funny thing you can notice here um, on the second picture on the top row that there's like a bar of different colored parchment. And that's because the atlas at the Geographical Society has these weird patches of parchment and anyone who's staying here longer than just a couple days, please go and look at that atlas and give me your theories about why that is, because I'm quite puzzled. Uh, I can't figure it out. One of the things that's a little bit strange about this sequence is that Agnese seems to have completed all of the rum lines before copying over the coastlines. 
This creates a much vi more visually busy environment in which to do the drawing where you could make more mistakes. And this wasn't um, the only way to do things. So for example, uh, I looked at both of these codices when I was at the Vatican, including with uh, microscopy, and they tended to do the geographical drawing um, before completing all of the rum lines, which to me would be the easier way to work, but this wasn't really the way that Agnese worked. Regardless, one of the last steps was to add gold. And this is also an image from the Geographical Society where something that was very weird to me uh, stood out, which is that things were colored before the gold was added. This makes sense if you have red paint or if you have bowl, because this was a common trick to make the gold look prettier. You lay it over red, it gives it a warmer glow. This is gold laid over exactly the wrong colors that you would not want. So at first I thought maybe this is because it was speculative production and he was gonna add the gold later, but then I realized almost all of his atlases have gold, so that doesn't quite make sense. In the end, um, in a second I'll explain to you what I think it might have been, but I'll just first explain this picture. This is just a really pretty picture that I found that I did want to show you guys. Um, I think that it seems most likely that Agnese used gold in powder, which is called shell gold. And the reason it was called shell gold is because you mix it up in a little shell. Um, and this is just a lovely picture that shows that. So, But the reason why I think he did it is because he wasn't particularly rigid about the colors he used for things, or even what would be gilded and what wouldn't be. So if he was coloring anyway, it might have been easier, just color everything and then add the gold where you want. It gives a bit more flexibility rather than you're locked into coloring certain things gold because it has no other color. <clears throat> so now I'm gonna move on and talk a little, little bit about some of Agnese's collaborators. If we look at the wind heads from the various atlases, we quickly get the impression that Agnese had a lot of collaborators among the miniaturists. But uh, one of them, he seemed to have used quite a lot. Uh, I've talked about this guy before. I call him the spiky pink and gold vignettes miniaturist. Um, I'm not gonna talk about him again, except to just note one thing. Uh, on both of these, the miniaturist took up space uh, where there were coastal toponyms. In fact, he erased them and drew his miniatures in that location. However, the names of the places in what space remained has been restored in Agnese's hand. Why I bring this up is merely to point out that Agnese did not simply give an atlas that was unfinished to a patron and say, I can recommend you a guy, but rather he agreed of who would illuminate and do the miniatures and gave it away and took it back and reviewed the work and made any corrections needed. Another very common collaborator of Agnese was this binder who made these very characteristic covers. And because he made so many, it's sometimes been suggested that um, this was an employee of Agnese's workshop. This is not the case. Uh, I'll point you to an article in a moment where there's examples of non-Agnese works bound by this same person. But the key features of this characteristic binding are the knotwork motif, blind and gold tooled fillets, and little corner stamps. The atlas kept in the Geographical Society of Lisbon for all of the visual chaos on it appears to have started as one of these characteristic bindings, but then was added to and you can see that on the bottom this frieze, which has little animals, it actually goes over one of the original fillets, and there's other little mistakes in there that suggest this was um, dolled up subsequently and not at all part of the original design. Also, it lost um, a lot of its leather because it was eaten by worms, so now the original cover, it's just a patch. 
but yeah, go and visit it if you like. They're very nice there. <laughs> I've uh, identified 25 different uh, dyes that the Agnese binder possessed. If you see any one particular kind of tooling, of course it's not really um, sufficient grounds to identify a person. It's not as if these were necessarily made as one-offs, but when you start to see them in groups, you can start to infer that, okay, this might have been the same guy. Um, and uh, the <clears throat> author who I wanted to point to you guys, first of all, was Anthony Hobson. He has a lot of nice data on other books, erudite books, bound by the same individual. And I also wanted to point people in the direction of this relatively new article about bookbinders in early modern Venice, because I think we take it for granted that uh, if there's gold and if there's fillets, more or less, we're talking the same price. But in fact, uh, this lady, her research shows that the cost for these things were quite meticulously itemized in early modern Venice. And we should bear in mind the fact that people were paying for every fillet when we look at the covers of atlases, because little things cost different. Okay, so the final section before I really quickly make an attribution, it's about uh, using and reusing models. So I hinted before about the fact that um, this carbon transfer method produces copies at a one-to-one -one scale. And also it's much easier to copy from a model you already have rather than to create or acquire a new one. So what one might expect is that Agnese has standalone charts, Agnese has atlases, he might have sourced the pages of his atlases from the same model as he used for his standalone charts. So to test this hypothesis, I started by looking at um, HM25, and I found that the sheets of, several of the sheets of the atlas fit really well together, suggesting they were sourced from a coherent chart. And I tried to match at a one-to-one -one scale this design to some of Agnese's charts. I did not find a match. I then tried the chart, uh, uh, the Atlas of 1553. Oh my goodness, typo, HM27. Um, and to my great surprise and delight, oh, sorry, one, one more thing to say before I get there. Also, it's a bit wonky um, because as you can see, this, this uh, green drawing, that's one chart, right? So you have a chart which has like a bit of France, Iberia, British Isles, and then a tiny bit of uh, Northern Italy and Northern Adriatic, but it's, it's quite misplaced. I don't know what happened there. That's a very silly mistake. Um, so then I took, I took this and I tried it against some of the charts. And I found we had a pretty good match at a one-to-one -one scale with this chart in the Bavarian State Library. The same could be said of a chart in the National Library of France. The same could be said of a chart in a library whose name I can't pronounce, which I think Chet attributed to Agnese. I'm not, I'm not wrong. The file is named after him. Um, and those of you who, oh, sorry, those of you who are keen observers might notice that uh, all three of these charts have the more outdated version of the British Isles, whereas this atlas has like the latest version associated with Agnese's last works. And so my question was like, if you have a new pattern for this region, if you have a new design you want to use, how do you link it up so you can reuse the rest of the chart? What I think Agnese did was the most simple solution, <laughs> which is to line up the southern coasts and then draw onto his model or put a patch and drawn to his model, uh, the new version. And you can see that uh, across them, the, the ways that the British Isles gets displaced, it's uniform, right? On the new version, it's dislocated a bit to the north and to the west, but the bottoms of the coast all line up. So it, it seems to me there was no real erudite process. It was a graphical fix. Okay, now we're almost at the end. So the chart I want to attribute to Agnese, if no one else has, is this anonymous chart in the Library of Congress. Very drab looking. I have a lot of reasons for this. 
Some of them are the had shading of the Red Sea, which is peculiar to Agnese and a very few others. It's this jigsaw pattern for Northern Scotland, which is peculiar to Agnese. Uh, it's the use of Cairo as a red coastal toponym, also rare outside of Agnese, and then the blobby Kirkenna Islands. If anyone has more questions about that, I'll be glad to give you a litany of more reasons, but I'll leave it there. So some closing thoughts. When we talk about Agnese often, it's kind of apologetically because he wasn't the most innovative, he wasn't always the most up-to-date. Moreover, uh, he wasn't the only, uh, this manuscript tradition wasn't the only game in town anymore. Printing was getting good by the time Agnese was working. And yet this guy made 100 atlases, and those atlases were valued enough to survive until this day. And I like to think that the people of the 16th century felt a similar way that Ernesto Vasconcelos felt when he looked at it. They simply appreciated a most perfect drawing. Thank you for your attention. Could I just ask, I'm sure you've mentioned this in previous presentations, but how exactly do you think they actually changed scale? Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously you're dealing with Agnese's atlas this morning, but the, uh, the problem of changing scale has always been one that I think many of us have thought about and not come to any conclusion, really. Yeah, I can answer that uh, with a grid. And when uh, I, I was just, before I was working on this and other things, I was working on that part of my thesis and finding even more examples of grid use. So <laughs> when, when that work is done, I think there will be lots more that you can read of my opinion on grids. But yeah, I mean, that's, that's basically it. Until you get the pantograph, you're using a grid. So, it's quite simple. Thank you very much, Shimon. You're welcome. First of all, I would like to compliment you for the excellent, excellent Thank presentation you. and the beautiful slides. Thank okay. You. No, I went for a new aesthetic this time. Uh, it was a risk. And as usual, I have a difficult question. Go for it. <laughs> I hope it is difficult. You have shown uh, mm -hmm. to us at least one example when you match a particular mm -hmm. chart of the old Mediterranean mm -hmm. with an atlas, mm -hmm. and you stated that this atlas was copied from this chart. No, no? I did not state that. I said I believe that the, m the parts of the chart and the parts of the atlas that overlap well probably came from the same model. I did not say one was copied from the other. No, it doesn't make sense. Okay, those my question doesn't make sense either. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask you if there are some marks of the copying process in those mm. atlas. I have never looked at a standalone chart of Batista Agnese, so even if the question did make sense, I wouldn't be able to answer it. Okay, so thank no, you. <laughs> thank you for the question. Thank you. This, this is to save me from some future embarrassment. Uh, I look at an Agnese chart and immediately I know it's his because of the, uh, the roses, the compass roses. He doesn't even use the same one. Uh, he's got like six or eight different yeah, designs, very different from each other. Uh, are there other map makers that also used a multitude of roses? Or will I always be able to walk up to a chart <laughs> see eight different roses and know it's by the, by the man? 
I wouldn't use that as the only criteria for it. <laughs> uh, I haven't I haven't looked for it, so I can't have noticed it. It's a good question. I don't know because I haven't looked into that question very much. You mentioned about the introduction of the what we would call a pencil graphite. Mm -hmm. Does that mean actually that that could be a, a very clear dating indication? If it's easy enough to, to you know, w unless you have to go into the full multispectral business yeah. to actually see it, but if if you looked at it underneath uh, uh, through an ordinary sort of uh, hand magnifying glass and you found that it was actually got, got pencil on, can you say that is post a certain date? And what is that date? Yeah, I think probably you could. I don't have that date ready off the top of my head, but I can shoot you the paper if you want where there is a good uh, satisfactory tracing of this chronology. The problem I would have is I would have difficulty feeling confident that I was looking at pencil um, because the only... Uh, real characteristic I would be able to point to is it has a luster, but I couldn't necessarily say that other materials couldn't have a luster. Maybe some metal points have more or less of a luster, you know? So it would be tricky. Uh, the easiest way to do that would be to just blast it with a little bit of XRF, because if it's pencil, you're not going to see anything, but if it's any kind of metal point, you're going to pick up metals. So the, there's a simple way to do it, that's pretty pretty straightforward, but you can't really be sure without some kind of equipment, I think. Now, uh, I welcome Chet van Derzer, who is uh, already a famous uh, historian of uh, maps uh, that has produced uh, many articles and uh, books about, uh, for example, Henricus Martellus, and about uh, monsters, and about many other subjects. And here he's going to uh, talk about Battista Agnese and um, his card. <laughs> Thank you, Emmanuel. It's a pleasure to be here, um, and a, a pleasure to continue talking about Baptiste Agnese, um, who I, I hope to show was a, a little bit more interesting than his general reputation uh, that Shima referred to. So I'm going to be talking about this chart, uh, the so-called King Hammy chart, after uh, two of its early owners. It's in the Huntington Library in Southern California, shelf mark HM45, as you see there. So it's usually dated to circa 1503, and that's one aspect of the chart that I will be disputing. It's dating, uh, and it's, uh, no one has ever attributed uh, the chart to a specific cartographer, and that's also what I will be doing. Um, so let's have a look at it. Uh, yes, it's said to be one of the earliest surviving charts to show the New World. And we see some of those parts here. Um, but the map is a, a bit of a puzzle in that despite the fact that it's generally regarded as being one of the earliest surviving charts to show the New World in any detail, it's remarkable for its absence from some of the basic books about the cartography of the New World, including Seymour Schwartz's and Ralph Ehrenberg's The Mapping of America. It's also absent from Kenneth Nebensall's Atlas of Columbus and the Great Discoveries. And it's barely mentioned in Hans Wolff's America Early Maps of the New World. So why is this? Uh, well, one reason is that it reveals very little about the New World in terms of place names, geography, or even decoration. It just doesn't say very much about the New World, and, and that's a, a puzzling aspect of the map. 
So let's have a closer look at it. So here we have Europe, of course, Africa, Asia. And if we zoom in on Europe, we can see that it's dense with place names uh, on both the coast of Europe and North Africa. Here we have Labrador and Newfoundland in the Atlantic. Uh, Hispaniola and Cuba in the Caribbean. The coast of South America. The eastern coast of Asia. And if we zoom in there, we can see that it is void of place names, which is interesting. And then as we begin to get into the details of this chart, let's have a look at the rum line network, which we see here. I've circled the nodes of the rum line network and the center of that network. Here we have the equator. And uh, very often the center point of the rum line network on a nautical chart is not a point of any particular geographical significance. Uh, we, I think we're familiar with that fact. We could, I could show you 100 nautical charts and the center point of the rum line network would not be a point of any particular significance. But in this chart, um, it seems that there is a difference in that regard and that this center point of the rum line network was chosen with a reason. And it seems to come from Ptolemy. So here we have a Ptolemaic world map in a 15th century manuscript. It covers, of course, 180 degrees of longitude. Here is the equator. And 90 degrees east is halfway between the two limits of knowledge in the east and west. And we can call that uh, the center of the Ptolemaic world, that is the, the center point between the western and eastern limits of knowledge on the equator. And that same point seems to have been chosen as the center of the King Hemi map. And its central position is marked by the rum line network. That is to say, in this case, it seems that the center point of the rum line network was chosen uh, intentionally with a reason. So let's look a little bit more at the circle of the rum line network. At the northern edge of the map, we see the Polis Articus, the North Pole, which means that it's 90 degrees, of course, from the equator to that point. And at the southern edge of the map, we have the Polis Antarcticus, the South Pole, which again means that it's 90 degrees from the equator to that point. And it seems that what we have here is, is a circle. The, the, the circle of the nodes of the rum line network is a circle with a radius of 180 degrees. And if we look at the eastern portion of Ptolemy's world map, we have first one peninsula in the east and then a second. And we can see that the same two peninsulas are at the eastern edge of this circle formed by the rum line network. So the rum line network encloses the world known to the ancients. It's a very striking and unusual use of the rum line network for a specific geographic purpose. So the 180 degrees of longitude that were known to Ptolemy are enclosed by this circle of the rum line network. But of course, what's within that circle is extended in the north and south to include to reach uh, the north and south poles. 
So we have within this circle, more or less, the part of the world known to the ancients, and outside of this circle, the more recent discoveries. It's not an exact picture of that distinction, uh, because, for example, Ptolemy does not know the southern parts of Africa, and also he doesn't know the world all the way to the North and South Poles. And in the King Hemi map, we do see southern Africa portrayed in some detail, so it's not exactly the world known to the ancients within this circle, but something quite close to it. So the King Hemi map contrasts recent discoveries with ancient knowledge, and that is to say it's a historical map. And this is uh, a surprising aspect of this chart, that it has built into it by way of its uh, rum line network, this distinction between the world known to the ancients and more recent discoveries. So uh, proceeding with this study, uh, I'm going to suggest that the map comes from not the earliest years of the 16th century, but rather the middle part of that century. And specifically, I'll suggest that it was made by Baptiste Agnese, who was active from about 1536 to about 1564. And the first piece of evidence I'll suggest uh, that tends to show that this map was made by Baptiste Agnese is the designation of the Azores as the Insulae Solis, or Islands of the Sun. So if we go back to the King Hemi map and zoom in on the Azores, they are designated as Islands of the Sun. And this is a designation that appears on many maps by Baptiste Agnese and uh, almost never on maps by other cartographers. So this is strong evidence that the King Hemi map was made by Baptiste Agnese. So here we have a map of the Atlantic by Baptiste Agnese in the Beinecke Library at Yale. And if we zoom in on the Azores, we can see that they are prominently labeled Insulae Solis. And looking at a couple of other maps by Agnese, and again, as, as Shima said, it's a pleasure to show these beautiful maps. Uh, here we have a map of the Atlantic by Agnese in the Library of Congress. And zooming in on the Atlantic, we again have this designation of the Azores as Insulae Solis. Another indication of Baptiste Agnese's hand in the King Hami map is the eight point stars uh, at extra rum line nodes. So going back to the whole chart, we have outside of the circle of the rum line nodes, these two supplementary nodes. Um, so rum lines are useful in navigation and ideally, you want to have the rum lines in all parts of a chart that are water. So this was a way to extend the rum line network beyond that circle formed by the rum line nodes into uh, more distant territory and more distant waters. So here are those two eight-pointed stars. And again, this is a feature that appears on Agnese's charts and which I have not found on um, nautical charts by other cartographers. And just to show a couple examples of that, uh, this is a signed chart by Agnese in Wolfenbüttel. Here is the circle of the Rumline network on that chart. And we have this supplementary eight-pointed star outside the circle of the Rumline network. So this is a distinctive feature of Agnese's cartography. Just to show one more example, we have a Agnese chart in Munich. Here is the circle of the Rumline network and an eight-pointed star outside that circle, the supplementary node of rum lines on this chart. 
And one more example, of, of course, I concur with Shima in the attribution of this nautical chart on vellum 13 at the Library of Congress to Agnese. And this chart also shows that eight-pointed supplementary <laughs> node. Here we have the circle of the Runline network. And then part of that eight-pointed star, which I guess there's been some trimming in this case. Another distinctive feature of Battista Agnese's cartography, which Shima mentioned, is the way he colors the Red Sea. Uh, and uh, as it happened, Shima didn't show examples of that. I will show, so our, our papers complement each other nicely in that regard. So here is the way the Red Sea is colored on the King Hami map. So we can see this series of hatches, <clears throat> distinct uh, red lines, often with a slight curve to them, on the King Hami map. And this is how uh, Agnese uh, colors the Red Sea. Uh, and it's a, a style of coloring that one doesn't find on nautical charts, not by Agnese. So here we have HM10 at the Huntington, uh, the map of Egypt and the Red Sea, and we can see exactly that same style of coloring the Red Sea. Same is true on this Agnese map in Venice at the Marciana. The Red Sea is colored exactly the same way. University of Pennsylvania, uh, Agnese Atlas, exactly the same style of coloring the Red Sea. New York Public Library, Spencer Collection, Manuscript 5, uh, a manuscript by Agnese, the same style of coloring the Red Sea. Chantilly, the same style of coloring the Red Sea. So this is very consistent across Agnese's works. The Wolfenbüttel chart I showed before, exactly the same style for coloring the Red Sea. And when we look at nautical charts by other cartographers, we do not find this same style of coloring the Red Sea. This is a chart by Ferducci. We see immediately it's a co completely different style for coloring the Red Sea. Uh, nautical chart by Jaume Oliva from 1563. Again, a completely different style for coloring the Red Sea. The coloration of the Red Sea on a chart by Pierre Desaliers made in 1550 is similar to Agnese's style, but clearly not the same, not those same short, slightly curved red lines. And two other cases that are more similar and yet still different, uh, a chart by Jacobo Russo from 1535, uh, we can see wavy lines that are basically continuous across the Red Sea, but not this, the same short curved hatching that we saw in Agnese's work. Again, we can see that difference. And a nautical chart by Matteo Prunes from 1559 in the Library of Congress. Again, it's a style of coloration that's superficially similar, but not the same short hatch mark. So quite strong evidence that the King Hami map is by Baptiste Agnese. And just again, comparing the two images so that we can see the difference in that style. Another indication that the King Hami chart was made by Baptiste Agnese is the handwriting. And this was actually what first, when I was studying the King Hami map, what first, uh, my first clue that it was by Baptiste Agnese was the handwriting. So Baptiste's, uh, Baptiste Agnese's handwriting is distinctive. Uh, one distinctive feature is in his capital S's, they have a, uh, a tilt to them, a tilt back backwards, or sorry, forwards. And we can see that quite consistently uh, in Agnese's works. And we see exactly the same thing in the King Hemi map, this distinctive S with a, a tilt forward to it. And which we see here again in another part of the King Hemi map. Another uh, fairly distinctive feature of Agnese's handwriting is 
the capital R with a long extended tail on it, which we see here on the King Hammy map here as well. And we see in other works by Agnese, so in Huntington HM10, uh, we see both the S with the forward tilt and the capital R with a slightly extended tail. And on this Agnese, another Agnese atlas at the Huntington, we again have the, the capital S tilting forward and the R with the uh, extended tail. It's worth pointing out that these distinctive features of Agnese's handwriting are not shared even by Agnese's disciple, Francesco Gisolfi. I'll just show that very quickly. Here's Gisolfi's map of the Black Sea in a manuscript in the Huntington. And if we zoom in, we, we don't see that we do not have that forward tilt to the capital S's. And there is no particular long tail to the capital R's. And the lowercase handwriting for place names on the King Hemi Chap also matches that on Agnese charts. So putting side by side um, <clears throat> a, a assigned Agnese map on the right beside the King Hemi chart on the left, the way the H's are written is very similar. the terminal E with a tail, the very similar way the G is written, the long S is very similar, the way the word Rio for river is written is very similar, the way the A is written is very similar, the M is very similar, and so forth. So the handwriting is very similar. So we've accumulated quite a bit of evidence that the King Hammy map was made by Baptiste Agnese. It's difficult, it would be difficult to explain these features of the chart if it were not made by Baptiste Agnese. So why would Baptiste Agnese make a chart sometime in the 1540s to the 1560s that looks like a chart that was made in about 1503? I suggest it's because he had an interest in making historical maps, and that's exactly what the King Happy map is. It's a map that shows what the world looked like at the beginning of the 16th century. And when we think about historical maps, we don't, uh, the, 16th, the early 16th century, the mid 16th century isn't what immediately comes to mind, uh, but there are other examples of historic maps made from this period, and Baptiste Agnese was one of the people making them. So in several of his manuscript atlases, uh, there is a historical map of the world. Uh, one example of which we see here, and the map shows the world more or less according to Tol Claudius Ptolemy. That is to sh say, it shows 180 degrees of longitude. Uh, the shape of the British Isles is Ptolemaic. Uh, Southern Africa is unknown, and the contours of Southern Asia are uh, quite close to what we see in Ptolemy's geography. And as I said, these historic maps of the world appear in a few of Baptiste Agnese's atlases, and they show that he had this interest in making historical maps. So here we have one in the Agnese manuscript in the Spencer collection in the New York Public Library. Some of them ha offer a bit more geographical detail than others, as we see here. But I want to point out that this is showing uh, a circumference, as it were, of 180 degrees. So 180 degrees north and south, 180 degrees east and west. And that's very similar indeed to what we have in the center of the King Hammy map. We have the world more or less as known to the ancients within this circle in the center of the King Hammy map. And the recent discoveries outside that circle with very few place names outside that circle. So again, the, the, this remarkable map uh, is a historical map. And one might think that 
uh, sort of demoting it from being one of the earliest maps to show the new world to and and from being from the early 16th century to uh, a historical map made in the middle of the 16th century would be a demotion. Uh, but I think actually the map is much more interesting for being a mid 16th century historical map rather than uh, a map that uh, shows us early ideas about the new world, but doesn't actually convey much information about the new world. So a few conclusions. Uh, the King Hammy map was made not circa 1503, but rather in the middle of the 16th century, and it was made by Baptiste Agnese. It is a historical map designed to highlight recent discoveries versus ancient knowledge. Agnese makes unusual use of the Circle of Rum Lines network uh, for this purpose, for this purpose of distinguishing uh, recent discoveries from uh, what was known to the ancients. <clears throat> and I'll mention one other map that does something similar, which is Martin Waldseemuller's world map of 1507, which not only has the two inset maps up above that show uh, the world more or less is known to Claudius Ptolemy and the more recent discoveries, but also in the main map itself uses two meridians. It highlights two meridians, uh, the prime meridian at zero degrees and the meridian at 180 degrees to distinguish between uh, the parts of the world known to the ancients and the more recent discoveries. So here, uh, Baptiste Agnese does something similar, but uses rather than two meridians, the circle of the rum line network. And finally, uh, it seems that the King Hammy map was inspired in part by the historic world maps that Agnese includes in several of his atlases of nautical charts. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have no question, just an obser observation, which you maybe missed or something, but I think it's interesting. Can you please go back to the, let's, uh, the, your first mention of the uh, central point of, of the King Hami map, which coincides with Ptolemy's? Yeah, we'll get there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, <laughs> stop, stop. Okay, and then a bit forward to his another map of where the Atlantic is in the center. Uh, uh, go forward, yeah, because, okay. Uh, th yeah, this one. Okay. It ends about the same point, right? It's eastern mm, part mm -hmm. is where the central part of the King Hami map is That's right. about, right? Yeah. So maybe this is also the span of 90 degrees mm. of longitudes, assumed to be, yeah. at least, right? So Thank you. Maybe he chose the, to end that map or mm. to pick a center due to the same mm -hmm. reasons. Thank you. So it's not a question, it's just an observation. Thank you. Okay. That's a good point. Thank you very much, Shep. I'm very, I'm very happy you finally decided to, to make these presentations about the Emmy King map. Uh, there is a small issue about that the location of the Ptolemaic equator. Mm. I quite agree with you that should be the Ptolemaic equator because of the poles, Polo's articles and Polo's no, no doubt, no doubt about that. But the real equator is there as well. Mm. And there is a scale of latitudes. Yes. Of a, of a design that is not Agnese's design. Mm -hmm. So there is a kind of inconsistency. Did Agnese really want it to depict a scale of latitude and the real equator together with the Ptolemaic one? I, I wish I knew more about what Pepis Agnese wanted. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> it's a wonderful question, but I, I, I just don't know the answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. A, a co comment and a question. Um, regarding the 190 degrees of the old world, if, or Ptolemy's world within, anyway, and you pointed out the, the Waldseemuller, uh, also Johann Reusch 1507, a uh, copper plate engraved uh, map, the two plates also follow that same pattern where the right plate is just exclusively the um, Ptolemaic or Old World, and the left plate is everything from Marco Polo, Columbus, Vespucci, et cetera. That's right. Um, so it, sound, it seems like a lot of people were thinking that way. Um, and coincidentally, 180 degrees is half of the world, so it kind of forced it upon them. <clears throat> My question is about the double equator. Do you have anything to say about that, please? And maybe point it out to these people. Yes. Uh, I think somewhere here. Uh, so the, the map does have two equators, and this is actually another feature um, that uh, makes it unlikely that it, it was really made in circa 1503. Uh, there are other maps that have two equators similarly, and they're all uh, much closer to the middle of the 16th century. So another feature, thank you for mentioning it, Greg, uh, that, that tends to confirm that the map is, is not from the earliest part of the 16th century, but rather from the middle of the century. Yeah, I wish we knew what he wanted. <laughs> I have a question too. Um, maybe the Caspian Sea uh, may, may be um, another clue uh, between the King Hamikart and the Battistaniese, the way it, it is represented. Do you think so? I'm sorry, the way what the is Caspian The Caspian Sea is sea. very similar here and uh, the Battistaniese. Uh -huh. So did you see that? I, I didn't, <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you for your presentation. And I had uh, two questions came into my mind. Uh, you told that you think it's because of uh, his interest of making this map. Um, uh, but couldn't it be someone who commissioned it for him? And what would be his interest? And uh, another question uh, for making such an effort for uh, att attributing the maps to Agnese. Um, would you think of um, a reason why he has not, uh, of why there isn't any uh, subscription or um, mentioning his name? Oh, well, why he didn't sign it? Yes. Yes. It I mean. <laughs> so it is very possible that this was a commission uh, by uh, a particularly uh, recondite uh, client uh, who was interested in the development of geographical knowledge over time. It's entirely possible. Um, why he didn't sign the chart, a another uh, curious aspect of the chart is why is there no textual indication of its nature? Um, and with regard to the latter question, uh, it's al that's also true of the historical maps in his atlases, that they're not, I think maybe one of them is labeled the world according to Ptolemy or something like that, but most of them do not have that designation. Uh, why he didn't sign the map? I don't know. He doesn't consistently sign his atlases either. Maybe Shima knows the percentage that are signed. I'm sorry? Yeah. So uh, there's, there's, no, there's, there's no a priori reason to expect that he would sign this chart. Um, uh, with uh, at least a, a hundred, a hundred atlases surviving, presumably meaning you multiply that by whatever um, for all the ones that, that didn't survive. Although because of their their beauty and so on, then then they, they obviously it will be much smaller proportion than with individual charts. But I've assumed therefore that he must have had an, a number of people who were actually 
working for him, and and uh, 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 and the evidence of that perhaps would be in the writing, unless um, in, in, indeed he had trained people up so precisely to imitate, or had indeed taught the, the, the perhaps the apprentices how to write in the first place. Uh, so they could they could imitate it the way his style. So that you know, the, I mean, am I right in thinking that there is no uh, evidence that uh, that there are different people writing, doing the uh, the, the toponymy for the charts? I I don't recall in, in encountering such evidence. The the hand seems pretty consistent across his work, um, and. Uh, I granted that Agnese may have trained p apprentices in his workshop. Uh, it, it seems unlikely that he would force them to adopt his exact same style of handwriting. Um, so, but the, the evidence of the hand, together with the other pieces of evidence, together taken together, they seem quite strong evidence that the, the chart was made by Agnese. First of all, thank you very much for your very beautiful presentation. I have two questions. One uh, about some details, uh, and one more general. Uh, the details, uh, I totally agree with you. It seems that there is a perfect uh, combination between the way uh, he writes uh, the uh, R, the S, uh, and the way he indicates the insule solis uh, Perfect, but I, I noticed uh, the way he, he writes uh, pre the Prete Gianni mm, mm -hmm. in in one map from from Battista Agnese, he he is called uh, he is named uh, Prete Giannis or something like that, and in this map the writing is uh, uh, Prete Yam. Mm. If I don't get wrong, uh, I don't know. The question is. Uh, uh, if you reasoned about this detail. Um, the other question is uh, about the impression that this map gives to me. Uh, you mentioned that, uh, in your opinion, this is like a, an historical map uh, in which the author uh, wanted to highlight the new discoveries, mm -hmm. right? Uh, my impression, but this is just an impression uh, given by mm, two elements uh, that I can see from this image. Uh, the impression to me is, is that this map is a sort of a replication of the Mappa Mundi model. Uh, I can see a circle, a very clear circle, a clear center that is outlined very well. And my impression is that he didn't want to highlight the new discoveries. He, he seems to be like reluctant to uh, show the new discoveries. It seems that he wanted to highlight the Mappa Mundi world and to put outside that, that world the new discoveries. Uh, I see that the line of the costs of the new world are thinner, are lighter mm -hmm. than the, than the other, other uh, costs of the known world. Uh, so <laughs> my impression is pretty different. It, 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 in, in my idea, he wanted to put outside the new discoveries and to uh, make more evident the Mappa Mundi model. But this is just an impression. Thank you very much again. Why? What would be his motivation? I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I really don't know. Uh, but this is maybe a, an element of reflection. I don't know. A retrospect, like a retrospective model to indicate that it's retrospective. Yeah. To, to, I wanted to add something to your remark. Uh, for me, it reminds me about the Miller Atlas 
You rem remember how is the Miller Atlas of 15, uh, uh, 15 19? 19. Yes. And you have a mapa, a mapa mundi, just in a circle like that, mm -hmm. including all the Portuguese uh, possessions, including Brazil. It's not the case there, but the construction of the map is very similar. Mm. So maybe you could just make a comparison to see if there are some connections. Uh, for example, for the, the Ptole Ptolemaic middle with a very, very convincing uh, mm. <laughs> demonstration, but the, the, the Mapamundi of the Miller Atlas it has the same idea, I think. Mm. I, I will look at it. Uh, yeah. Going back to the Prester John part of your question, uh, I don't know why there would be that difference in, in the way the name is spelled. Um, but going to your more general observation, the similarity between this historical map, which is certainly by Baptiste Agnese, and the center part of the King Hammy map, to me really uh, makes it seem that there is a historic element to this cartography. That is to say that the, the, the map is trying to show that distinction. And I, I interpret, uh, and certainly there are other possible interpretations, but I interpret the lack of place names outside of this circle as his attempt to reflect the poor knowledge of the, the new discoveries at the, in the early part of the 16th century. Um, but again, other interpretations are certainly possible. Uh, Chet, I have another question, a difficult one again. Okay. Well, what time do you think Batista Nesi was trying to reproduce in terms of cartographic knowledge? For example, when you compare this map with the Cantino, Madagascar is the, the island of San Lorenzo is absent, mm -hmm. but the coast of Africa is almost perfect. So I agree, it was quite a reluctant to, 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 in some ways, to mix up old knowledge with new uh, knowledge. Uh, do you think he was trying to replicate, what, 1500, 1510, uh, before that? Uh, I would say the first decade of the 16th century would be my guess. It, it's interesting uh, that while, yes, Madagascar is absent, the coastal place names in Africa are, are quite thorough. So it's, it is a little bit of a jumble in terms of trying to figure out exactly what moment he's trying to depict. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, three things. Uh, one is Madagascar is there, but that's Polo's Madagascar, yeah. not the Madagascar renamed by the Portuguese. But that's right. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is that the New World, or um, Labrador, Newfoundland, the Caribbean, and, and South America, follow very closely follow a model of of that period of. Uh, the 1504 of uh, Visconti Maggiolo in Fano, Italy, and the Kunzmann II in Munich, uh, same place names, mm -hmm. the same geographical delineation, things like that. So uh, if he, as I believe, he drew that uh, sometime 1550 or whatever, he was using a model from 1504, yeah. 1506, somewhere right yeah. in there. Uh, the last thing is, I'm, I'm just giving this one away, but in the bottom right-hand corner is a line of 28 dots that I've never seen mentioned in the literature. Um, who knows why, but I was curious if, uh, if you've ever seen dots like that of randomly put down in the corner for no reason. Uh, I, th I think it's a scale of miles, uh, and I, if I recall correctly, there are some other Agnese charts where he, he depicts he makes a, a similar scale sort of uh, very bare bones scale. it's very bare bones it's not even outlined with straight lines or anything it's just a random okay thanks Sorry, i can't hear you Thank you.